We decided to focus in this study specifically on leukemia acuta because it's not commonly reported in the literature in large numbers, and we had seen multiple cases at our own cancer center here in North Carolina and wanted to better investigate how this presents and in what patients it presents. That's Dr. Lindsay Stroud, and this is Dermatology Weekly, the weekly podcast from MD Edge Dermatology. I'm MD Edge editor Elizabeth Mishkati. And I'm MD Edge editor Terry Rudd. Today, Leukemia acutus should be high on the differential in patients presenting with leukemia. Dr. Vincent DeLeo talks with Dr. Lindsay Stroud and Wasim Haidari about their research on the presentation of leukemia acutus and its clinical implications. In the news, we have the results of a study that estimated the global prevalence of oral lichen planus. We'll also have an interview with Dr. Daniel Siegel, clinical professor of dermatology at SUNY Downstate, who offers his insight about the use of natural ingredients for the hair and skin. You can reach Dermatology Weekly by emailing us at podcasts at mdedge.com. You'll also find that email address in the podcast description. And now the news. Oral lichen planus appears to be more prevalent in women people aged 40 and older, and people living in non-Asian countries. That's according to the first-ever systematic review and meta-analysis of the global prevalence of oral lichen planus. The analysis includes studies with general population data and clinical patients, and it covers more than 650,000 people in 25 countries. Based on the data, the authors estimate the overall prevalence of oral lichen planus was 0.9% in the general population and 1% in clinical patients. Globally, oral lichen planus appear to be more prevalent in women. In the population-based studies, the prevalence rates were 1.55% in women compared with 1.1% in men. In clinic-based studies, the rates were 1.7% and 1.1% respectively. Among people aged 40 years and older, the prevalence was also higher, 1.9% versus 0.6% in clinic-based studies. The greater prevalence in women could be related to fluctuating female hormone levels. Age-related differences could be the result of long-standing oral habits or changes to the oral mucosa over time, age-related metabolic changes, decreased immunity, or nutritional deficiencies. Of the 25 countries in the studies, Brazil had the highest prevalence, at about 6%. The researchers say that's possibly due to Brazil's higher rates of smoking and alcohol abuse. India had the lowest prevalence rate, at 0.02%. North America's rate was 0.1%. The study appears in JAMA Dermatology. Dermatology Grand Rounds at George Washington University last month, Dr. Daniel Siegel spoke about the translational science behind natural ingredients. Afterward, Dr. Adam Friedman spoke with Dr. Spiegel about his presentation. Dr. Siegel is a clinical professor of dermatology at SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn. Dr. Friedman is a professor and interim chair of dermatology at GW. Thank you so much, Dan. You know, you covered such a broad gamut, but even before delving into the ingredients that have the most supportive evidence, just something simple. What is your response to the patient that comes in and says, Doc, I just want something natural. I don't want anything, chemicals, no prescription medications. Tell me what to do natural. What is your response? Because we get that a lot, and there's not a lot of guidance of how to really, really guide the patient. I like to tell the patient who comes in with that sort of opening remark that there are lots of natural products that could be useful. But first we need to see what their problem is and then we can discuss the options. And I like to tell them, much as I started this morning, pointing out that just because it's natural doesn't mean it's good nor even safe. So that we want to see what their problem is and then we can think of the options and see if we can work something out that will please them. But I don't look at natural as being a separate part of the armamentarium. I think it's just it's part of it when appropriate. I think it's so important not to 
disconnect with the patient, you know, undermine their beliefs uh, because they'll go somewhere else. You know, you need to partner with them. And I think that's often a problem is that because we as physicians don't have comfort in this area, we either A, dismiss it because it's not allopathic medicine, or B, we're just afraid to talk about it altogether. Now, you mentioned a lot of products today that have nice, maybe preclinical or some clinical evidence. If you had to pick two or three that A, you yourself recommend, and B, have the evidence to support those recommendations, which would those be? Uh, probably the top ones would be the various oils, waxes, and greases that are out there that are effective. Again, the classic one we talked about was the Galen's cold cream with rose water, olive oil, and beeswax. And again, modern cold creams unfortunately have so many other products like emulsifiers that can strip the body's natural oils, preservatives that can cause allergic dermatitis, you can have irritation. So if a patient can tolerate, and by tolerate, I mean they're in a situation where they can do the laundry often, where they don't, they're not sitting on a you know, $10,000 couch, where they can grease up, I think a grease is wonderful. I tell the patients, when you take a shower, you take that shower as cool as you can, you only use mild soap like Dove in your underarms and your, your privates and your hands and feet. I say when you get done showering, if the room is warm, before you even towel off, you grease up at that point. I tell them, you know, have the olive oil or safflower oil, use it right there. Then patients will often say to me, why don't we just go ahead and just put some oil in the bath? And I say, because then when you stand up and slip, somebody in your family will sue me. <laughs> so I want you to put it on after you've done your washing. Now, two kind of follow-up questions with respect to oil. So first, how do you ensure quality assurance? I think that's one of the biggest issues. because These are really not regulated like a drug, and they're not making drug claims. There are so many different companies that will make products that contain these ingredients. And as you mentioned in your lecture, depending on where it's cultivated and grown, there could be high variance in terms of the inherent fatty acids that really make these useful. So how do we ensure that patients are actually getting what we're telling them to get? Well, that's a difficult one, because when you listen to the news, you'll hear at times of adulterated olive oil that allegedly is genuine Italian olive oil, but it's adulterated with safflower oil, rapeseed oil, which is canola oil. So there's, there's even adulteration in the food industry. Fortunately, the adulteration, the oils that are used may not give it the nice pure taste, but they're probably still safe and efficacious. And as I mentioned in the talk, if you don't like it on your skin, you can always use it as a salad dressing. <laughs> <laughs> Part two to that, which uh, came up towards the end of, of your talk, you know, we, we have a lot of patients who use oils for hair care, and there has been growing concern, various levels of concern, depending on what oil you're talking about, ranging from castor oil, jojoba oil, coconut oil, that not only could these prevent hair growth by being inclusive, they also could be pro-inflammatory and facilitate the overgrowth of certain organisms on the skin. What is your recommendation to the patient who's going to use something but you got to give them the right guidance of what to use to not cause problems, rather, you know, hopefully keep things status quo. Well, the best pearl that I've ever learned on grease for hair is to use glycerin. That was taught to me by David Whiting in Dallas back when I was a resident, and I've yet to find anything better. My concern with oils and greases on the hair is not only do they create an environment that will let things grow under them, but in many hairstyles in the population using the oils and greases, you've got a reservoir in the hair that's twisted or coiled. And so you're going to actually not aerate that aerate oil, so you get a wonderfully moist area that grows yeast, fungi, and bacteria very effectively. And so glycerin, you, A, you don't get that, you, you, you get a eumectant effect, you don't get that wet under the occlusion effect, and you also have some antibacterial effect from the glycerin itself. All right, so glycerin is good, that's the message. Thank you so much for your time and for being here at GW. Thank you. We'll be right back after this message. And now, Dr. Vincent DeLeo, Dr. Lindsey Stroud, and Wasim Hadari. Today we're talking to Dr. Lindsey Stroud and Wasim Hadari about leukemia cutis. Can you both please introduce yourselves for our listeners? My name is Lindsay Stroud, and I'm an assistant professor of dermatology at Wake Forest University School of Medicine. Uh, my name is Rasim Haidari, and uh, I work as a research fellow at the Department of Dermatology at Wake Forest. Well, we thank both of you for giving up your time and joining us this morning to talk about uh, your manuscript on leukemia cutis. So let's start with some of the cutaneous manifestations of leukemia that we might see in our patients. 
Patients with leukemia can have a variety of different cutaneous manifestations of having this oncologic disease. Some of these manifestations of leukemia are what we would term perineoplastic in nature, whereas they're separate from the leukemia but occurring in close association with leukemia, such as sweet syndrome. Uh, we decided to focus in this study specifically on leukemia cutis, which is defined as direct extension of leukemic cells infiltrating directly into the skin in a patient. Uh, we were interested in looking at this because it's relatively uh, not commonly reported in the literature in large numbers, and we had seen multiple cases at our own cancer center here in North Carolina and wanted to better investigate how this presents and in what patients it presents. That's great. So we understand the objective of uh, your study and what you published. You looked at 46 patients with leukemia acutis over a 17-year period. Can you tell us about the demographics of those patients? So um, the demographic of our patients, um, we had uh, mainly uh, adults, so patients over age of 18. The average age of our patients was 58 years. We had uh, primarily uh, Caucasian patients among our, in our cohort, but uh, we did have some African-American patients among the 46 as well. And uh, the, the ratio of uh, women to men was, uh, was slightly female predominant. It was 1.3 to 1 ratio. And um, they had a variety of types of leukemia. So, so it sounds like it's a little bit older population that you're talking about. What was the most common types of leukemia in your patients? Uh, the most common type of leukemia that we um, observed was AML, acute myelocytic leukemia, and uh, that actually was kind of uh, what the prior literature has reported that leukemia cutis tends to present in patients with AML, but we had ALL uh, and other types of leukemia as well. So you have a patient with leukemia who gets uh, leukemia cutis. Can you describe what we should be looking for in our patients? What, what does leukemia cutis present as clinically? So one of the interesting things about our study was the heterogeneity in the presentation of leukemia cutis in this patient population. Historically and in, in prior literature studies, uh, many of uh, the previous types of leukemia acutis have been reported to be solitary lesions and often are described as nodules. Um, we certainly saw presentation of solitary nodules in our patients that we most commonly saw uh, multiple papules was the primary presentation, but we had more unusual presentations as well, including mucosal lesions. Uh, we had a case of leukemia cutis that mimicked cellulitis. Um, so there was quite a variety. We had some ulcerative lesions as well uh, that our patients presented with. So I think it is important to recognize that while it, it may most commonly present as small papules or small nodules on the skin, that it can present in a whole variety of different ways and in different forms. So the clinician should have a high index of suspicion for leukemia cutis in the right patient. Yes, so I guess, guess what you're saying is that when we see a lesion as a clinician in a patient with leukemia, we should be thinking about leukemia cutis. And then, of course, the only way to see what it is is by biopsy, I guess. Yeah, that's correct. A biopsy for leukemia cutis certainly is most times diagnostic uh, for the disease. But I think paying attention to the entire skin surface of a patient with leukemia is also vitally important because they are not always going to present on the trunk or on the arms or legs where they're easily identifiable. Some of our patients had lesions in the scalp. Um, like we'd said, mucosal surfaces like the oral mucosa and in the genital region as well. So I think it's important to do a very thorough and comprehensive full skin exam of a patient with leukemia. I think that's very good advice for our listeners dealing with that group of patients. They're sick, they have leukemia, but we should be looking uh, at a total skin exam is what you're saying, and I think that's a great idea. 
So what did you guys learn about the interval between leukemia diagnosis and leukemia cutis diagnosis? Sure. Um, the interval between uh, the leukemia and leukemia cutis diagnosis, um, based on what we found, was often very short. Um, it, it depended on the type of leukemia that they presented. But, for example, for uh, AML, which was our uh, majority of our patient, on average, it was about uh, five months between the diagnosis of leukemia and leukemia cutis. Some of the other um, types of leukemia, also the average time was uh, the interval was about six months. Some were much shorter, um, like around a month. So that kind of tells us, again, the importance of keeping um, leukemia cutis high on the differential for these patients. And also what was interesting with our study, we looked at uh, the different uh, stage of therapy that patients develop leukemia cutis, and uh, there was some variety. Not only did we see patients who uh, developed leukemia cutis lesion with initial presentation of, of their leukemia, we also saw that it can present with the relapse or during a salvage or a consolidation therapy. Yeah, to build upon so, what Wasim said, it's almost in our study there was almost a, a bimodal distribution of presentation of leukemia cutis with the majority of our patients actually presenting with leukemia cutis right at the onset of their leukemia diagnosis. And many of these patients, the skin findings, you know, arose and were diagnosed simultaneously as the leukemia. And we had another significant group of patients that developed leukemia cutis with relapse of their leukemia. So you, you're kind of seeing it at different stages in, in the patient's disease course with leukemia, but I think the fact that we saw so many as a presenting finding of leukemia should be noteworthy, I think, for us as dermatologists to recognize that, uh, you know, you may not know that the patient has leukemia at the time that you're actually evaluating them, and I think points to the need to biopsy any spots that look unusual or a little bit different in nature. I think that's really important. So what you're saying is sometimes the skin lesion was the presenting lesion in some of your patients with leukemia, I guess. That's correct. So uh, the prognosis for leukemia cutis in a patient with leukemia, what would you have to say about that if a patient asked you about what the leukemia cutis meant in terms of their prognosis? Based on our study and also some of the other literature that is out there, it does seem like the presence of leukemia cutis um, oftentimes is a negative prognostic factor and that patients that have leukemia cutis um, oftentimes have a shorter kind of overall mortality compared to patients that do not have leukemia cutis. I think, again, it depends a little bit on the subtype of leukemia that a patient has. But if you specifically look at a subset of patients with AML or acute myelogenous leukemia, it is thought to be somewhat of a negative prognostic factor. That's uh, very interesting, very sad, but, but also very interesting. So this article is really excellent review, not only of your patients, but of the literature concerning leukemia cutis. So what would you say are the takeaway points for our listeners. Yeah, another point that I would make is just, I think this study underscores, I think, the importance of having a good close working relationship with our oncology colleagues so that we can really facilitate prompt evaluation of these patients if our oncology colleagues are concerned about any skin lesions and can really offer some help and expertise in the diagnosis of leukemia cutis and also um, excluding things like cutaneous infections or other potential perineoplastic diseases. So I think, you know, we should recognize the important role that we can serve in both the diagnosis and in the care of these patients as they're going through their their oncologic treatment. I want to say that was a a great podcast concerning leukemia cutis. I think all of our listeners should be sent to read your article in greater detail. And we want to thank you guys for taking your time and your expertise to talk to our listeners today about a very important subject. So thank you very much. 
And that concludes this week's episode of Dermatology Weekly. To get past and future episodes of Dermatology Weekly, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Or simply ask Amazon's Alexa, Alexa, play Dermatology Weekly on Apple Podcasts. I'm Terry Rudd. For Dr. Vincent DeLeo, MD Edge editor Melissa Sears, and all of us here at MD Edge, I'm Elizabeth Mishkati. Thanks for listening.